Thanks, Thank Kevin. You. Well, good evening, everybody, and great to see you all here. I recognize a few voices, uh, voices, a few faces, some from people I've known for years, and some I've seen here and, and uh, even last year at the symposium. Uh, so I am looking forward to this year's symposium. Now, now Kevin, thank you very much. I was, uh, appreciate that introduction. I met Kevin almost a year ago, and actually up in Shepherdstown. So the Virginia Forum, he was giving a battlefield tour of the Battle of Shepherdstown, so right after Antietam. And I literally followed him over Hill and Dale, quite literally. There was even some mud. So it, it was a great tour. He's a great historian and, and really engaging on these tours. So if you haven't had an opportunity to go to one of a, his tours and it, that opportunity's around, take it. Really appreciate it. Um, so to let's see if I can actually get this going right. Yes. So I want to thank all of you for being here. You know, Things like events like this, the symposium, it's, it's sharing, it's, it's knowledge. What can we learn? It kind of expand our horizons. So all the way back to George Washington, I mean, he thought that knowledge was important, and I do. I'm hoping to learn things from all of you tonight, and hopefully I can share a few things with you that you didn't know. Expand everybody's horizons just a little bit. Before we do that, though, Today's a special day. Everybody knows what today is as a special day? It, whoops, wrong button. There we go, it is Washington's birthday. Now, by a show of hands, how many people sang happy birthday to George? <laughs> you did? Oh, that's right, I made you do, we worked together. So yeah, okay. All right, so two of us, that's a little bit awkward. Let's, we can loosen up. Should we sing right now? Yeah, yeah maybe not. <laughs> um, but in, in honor of his birthday, I am wearing my George Washington bow tie. It's not actually his bow tie. Mount Vernon won't part with those, but it does have his signature on it. And not that I'm really making a plug for Mount Vernon's bookstore, but that's where I got this one. So it, it's, it's great to be here on his birthday because part of, part of the talk, we're going to be talking about George Washington. February is also Black History Month. And so part of, part of what we're talking about, it, it's totally appropriate that it's both George's birthday and Black History Month. And so as, as we talk about knowledge, talk about things that we may not have known before, we can kind of keep that in mind. It's a balance. There are two different parts of it. Now, you may be wondering, since most of the talks that, that happen here, and this is Manassas, it's heavily Civil War. So why are we talking about stuff from the founding era? Well, that's because that's what I'm interested in. Um, so th this is kind of a derivative uh, of some of my, the research from my doctorate. And I was looking at the influence of political words from ancient Greece and Rome on the founding era. So how did the founders talk about those ancient concepts, political concepts, and apply it to our founding? So that's kind of what we're gonna explore, just four words, freedom's words. So freedom, liberty, tyranny, and slavery. Very much political words to America's founders. And then there's the other part, for a large portion of America's population. So that's, that's what we're gonna look at and see how they had their differing perspectives. And it's about stories, so what I want to do is share with you some stories of these people. This is uh, just a map of the colonies, because there were colonies at the time, running from Georgia up through Maine. And you can see in the white squares, those are some of the places we're going to visit on our set of stories today. So at the American founding, uh, the, the, the founders were very passionate about freedom from what they perceived as British oppression, tyrannical oppression. 
They wanted to be free from that, have liberty to do what we wanted to do rather than being beholden to a king and a parliament across the ocean. But since 1619, when black Africans were first brought to Virginia, that's where they first came in to these colonies, they became enslaved. And so you had founders who were saying, we need political separation from overreach, oppression by the British, yet at the same time, enslaved people denying them those same kind of freedoms. But the, these, these concepts, these ideas are all the same. And, and you know, they, they're very passionate, the founders. So Patrick Henry in 1775, in, in a speech in Richmond, and you'll know the speech, said, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. So how did they then talk about all of these, these concepts? They certainly shared information with each other. They wrote pamphlets here within the, U, in, in the colonies, but also back and forth with people in England. They wrote letters in newspapers. Those were printed in broadsides. So they'd be hung up in, outside of taverns. All across America, people were talking about these ideas, not just the famous founders who were well-educated, normal people. Any one of us could have been a farmer, a storekeeper. We would have access to that same kind of information. And we could probably read. Americans were better, were generally more literate than, than the British were, e even normal people probably because that physical separation from England, we were self-sustaining pretty much. Yes, there were royal governors, but the, the legislative bodies, they were all Americans. They were colonists who were elected by the people in those colonies to represent them. And then the governors were kind of like a, almost a, a, a stamp of approval. So there, were, there was a lot of freedom of expression and sharing of ideas. All, all across the colonies. So what I'd like to do first is we're going to talk about these, these words from the founders, just four founders. All of them that we're going to talk about tonight are from Virginia. And we're going to start with Patrick Henry. And we, we already mentioned him a little bit, the give me liberty or give me death speech. He was born in Hanover County, in 1736, and was a very well-known order. Great gift for public speaking. Pretty fiery, too. He could you can really feel his passions coming out, and there he is. Kind of an attractive guy. People like to listen to him, and he was very engaging. Now, originally, he wanted to be a, a farmer or a storekeeper or something like that, and it just wasn't working for him. So he decided, I'm going to become a lawyer. They talk a lot. He likes to talk. Here's the problem with that, though. Most lawyers in this time, there were no law schools, so you couldn't go to law school. But normally, before you became a lawyer, you went to college. You got a bachelor's degree. Henry didn't go to college. But after you've graduated from college, you read the law. Now, has anybody heard that phrase before? Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, you're an apprentice. You apprentice yourself to an existing lawyer, somebody who's pretty well known, and you can probably pay him a little bit. In, in, I guess you could call it tuition. And you live with him. You, you work in his office. You do some of the nug work. You might copy out a will, something like that. And then you study English common law because that's what was here. When you're done, you prove to a body of lawyers that you know what you're doing, you become a lawyer. Did Henry apprentice himself to anybody? Nope, he did it all on his own. He was a really smart guy. He passed the bar after being examined by one of his examinees or examiners was George Wythe one of the best known and respected lawyers in, in Virginia. So really smart guy. He later became 
uh, got into politics, had a whole series of positions, including the House of Burgesses. He was at the First and Second Continental Congresses. Uh, after that, he didn't have any other national level positions. He was the governor for five terms, which, you know, today that doesn't happen. So what, what else did he say about freedom, liberty, slavery? Well, he thought that all these political issues, that it came down to a question of freedom or slavery. And without talking about those at the political level, then that means that's it. That's the end. The debate is about freedom. If not that, it's over. He also saw war coming. So knew that we had to talk about this. The, the, the politicians had to talk about what Virginia's response to Britain was going to be. And he said at one point in this debate, if we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest, the coming war with Britain. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. So really, in his mind, if Virginia didn't fight forever slaves to Britain, He also knew that events in Boston, Boston Massacre, for example, as they're evolving, the war's actually started. There is no way to avoid the war anymore. It's happening. And he said, the war has actually begun. There is no peace. And then concluded his speech with, give me liberty or give me death. Now let's go a little bit deeper into Virginia and talk about Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, we all know, was a planter. And he had huge plantations, but he was also a man of the Enlightenment. So both in, in, in Europe and in America, this resurgence of classical ideas, classical knowledge, classical education, so it, neoclassicism, was the basis of the, the Enlightenment. So it was a really kind of a political, uh, both political and philosophical movement, what should the relationship be between the rulers and the people? And generally speaking, the Enlightenment guys were saying, the people have a God-given right to be more than just oppressed by their government. They ought to have a voice. This is where the, the idea comes in of the, the in America, the, ruler, the ruling people are there by the will of the people. So any politicians in office, it's because the people wanted them there. So very much a, an enlightenment idea. So he's a philosopher, he's a scientist, he's a naturalist. And the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. In the Declaration, two, one of the main things that he made sure he wrote into it was the charges against the king, not just parliament, which is really where the arguments had been before, but the king it has it out for Americans. That basically his entire reign was, had repeated injuries and usurpation, usurpations, all having in direct object, so the goal, establishment of an absolute tyranny over the colonies. So the Declaration of Independence, yes, it says we're free, but it's really almost like a legal, a, a police charge sheet against the king, saying, nope, we don't buy what you're saying anymore. Up the street from here, we have George Mason. Now, I, I'm, everybody knows Gunston Hall, reasonably, up in Fairfax County. So George was born at Gunston Hall in Prince William County. So until 1725, that, there was no Fairfax County. It was all part of Prince William. So Prince William was a huge county, and it divided. So I think that's a great tie-in with us being here in Prince William. Now, Mason also was a planter. He also was involved in politics, the House of Burgesses, the 
First and Second Continental Congresses. He was also at the convention for after the Articles of Confederation, we're looking for a constitution. He was absolutely for having a constitution, but was one of three delegates who voted against it. Why did he vote against it? It was missing one thing. Rights. The Bill of Rights. He considered that a fatal flaw. Again, it's all about his fear that without a Bill of Rights written, that the US government, an American government, could impose on its citizens the same kind of tyrannical oppression that Britain had done. And we fought a war against it, so it, it, his fear is, without a Bill of Rights, we're heading into another war. He wrote the, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which you see here, and it actually wound up influencing the ultimate Bill of Rights. So Mason voted against the Constitution, but was absolutely an American patriot. And in fact, he spent about $70,000, which in the, at that time was a lot of money, in the American contest against Britain. So he put his life, his livelihood, where his mouth was. Now, with some, George Mason, other, unless you're from this area, went to the school named after him, you probably don't know who he is. So we can almost think of him as the lesser of two Georges. So now let's go to the greater of two Georges. So George Washington, the indispensable man. I, you know, I, don't, I don't think we would be America were it not for George. That's why he's called the father of our country. And he was called the father of our country while he was still alive. So people then understood the really important role he played. He grew up in the Fredericksburg area, eventually moving up to Mount Vernon. Uh, it was Fairfax County at that time he moved. <laughs> and throughout his life, he served in and out of public life. So he was a justice of the peace. He was in the House of Burgesses. He was at both uh, Continental Congresses. It was actually at the Second Continental Congress where he was appointed Commander-in-Chief. So he served as Commander-in-Chief, of course, and as President before retiring back to Mount Vernon. Um, he also, of course, led uh, a mission on uh, Governor Dinwiddie's orders up to what is now Pittsburgh area, claimed by Virginia, making sure, checking to see if the French were creeping into territory claimed by Virginia. Yes, he kind of started the French and Indian War then, and he later served in it as, under General Braddock. So really acquitted himself there, and it's really in that time as a, as a lieutenant colonel and colonel that he kind of earned his spurs, I guess you could say, as a soldier, so that when we ultimately went to war, he was one of the best positioned people in all of the colonies to lead the army. So what did he say about freedom and slavery and liberty? Washington is not really known as an educated man. He never went to college. He did get a surveying license from the College of William and Mary, but that's not an academic education. And he didn't have the normal tutors and classical background. He couldn't read Greek and Latin, but he could absolutely hold his own with his contemporaries, the other founders, because he understood a lot of this. He did read a lot, an extensive library, very utilitarian in his reading. If he needed to improve his farming lands, well, he read about farming. When he became commander in chief, he started reading a lot about military, um, about military matters. So he actually was pretty well educated. And he had, like all Americans at the time, a good understanding of these ideas of freedom, liberty, slavery, and tyranny. 
as General Washington encouraging his soldiers to fight and really helping them understand why it was so important that they fight and stand up to what's arguably at the time the most powerful and best army in the entire world and, and you get a bunch of farmers and shopkeepers going up against them. So he, he said to them, it's so important because freedom or slavery must be the result of our conduct. There therefore can be no greater inducement to men to behave well. And it's, it's really important for them to, to really stand up for it. All freedom on this continent was up to them. Fast forward through the end of the fighting, um, his headquarters, he was up in Newburgh, New York. There's a mutiny. You've probably heard of it. There wasn't a mutiny, but it was really close. And in his address to the officers, his officers, who were getting close to mutiny, he really chastised them, said, you fought for American freedom from Britain. And yet, some of you would attempt to, he said, overturn the liberties of our country, which would only bring more bloodshed and discord to the country. So this is again about freedom. It's about liberty. It's about tyranny. But it's political on all of those. Shortly after that, before he... Re uh, left Newburgh to resign his commission, he wrote a series of circular letters to all of the, all of the states, uh, addressed to the governors. And basically, he was sending out his, his explanation of why we need national unity. So we fought a war, but we're really still a collection of independent states, loosely gathered together. So his argument was, we need to be unified as one nation. And he said, it, there is a natural and necessary progression from the extreme of anarchy to the extreme of tyranny, and that arbitrary power is most easily established on the ruins of liberty. Again, this is very much a political idea of, of these words. Really trying to impress on the states, on the political leadership in the states, you need to bind together. That's the only way we're all going to be safe. But then there's the other end of the story. So what do black Americans think? Some of them are going to be free, that we're going to visit and hear some of their stories, and some are enslaved. Some were enslaved and then gained their freedom. And so we're going to start, we left off with George Washington. So you know, after he resigned his commission, he came back to Mount Vernon. So we're going to start again at Mount Vernon with Oni Judge. Um, so her name was actually Ona, but like I'm Lawrence, then I'm called Larry. I go by Larry. William, Willie, same kind of thing. Put an end on it and a Y on it. So you'll hear both Ona and Oni periodically. So she was born at Mount Vernon in probably 1773. And when she was about 10 years old, moved into the mansion, or at least worked in the mansion, as a personal servant to Martha. Later, uh, when she was 15, George had just been elected president, so the, he, he got to go to the national capital, first New York and then later Philadelphia. She and seven other enslaved members of the household moved with Washington. Now, when they got to Pennsylvania, there was a problem because Pennsylvania in 1780 had passed a law on the gradual emancipation uh, of enslaved people. So it didn't free them immediately, but for the most part, if you were born there, once you became 23 years of age, you were automatically freed. But there was also an impact. There were, there were limits on how long an enslaved person could remain in Pennsylvania and still be kept in bondage. So. Washington concocted this idea of rotating the, the, uh, the staff in his household from Philadelphia back to Mount Vernon. Just keep them going back and forth 
to avoid the, this uh, Pennsylvania law. And he specifically asked his secretary, um, so executive assistant, you know, a manager, to make this rotation happen, and this is a quote, under pretext that may deceive both them, the enslaved people, and the public. So he knew what he was doing as he's, as he's rotating these, these people. Well, Ona didn't like that idea. She's got a little bit of a taste of possible freedom, so she decided to escape. She one day left that mansion, got on a boat in the harbor, and sailed up to New Hampshire. She landed in Portsmouth. Washington wasn't too happy about this, had several agents working for him. He sent them up to Portsmouth. Go find her and bring her back. Two different agents spoke with Judge. And, and neither one of them were able to get her back. She didn't want to come back. Um, and so after that, Washington put an ad in the newspaper. And part of it, you can see it right there. I know it's difficult to read, but part of it says, as there was no suspicion of her going off, nor no provocation to do so, it is not easy to conjecture whither she has gone, or fully what her design is. So Washington then contacted a man named um, Joseph Whipple. So he was the customs collector in, in Portsmouth, and said, find her and get her back here. Well, Whipple found her, tried to convince her to return, and, and she, she kind of agreed on the condition that the Washingtons would free her upon their deaths. And so that was going to require a little, little bit of negotiation between Whipple and Washington. So she used that time to go hide. He couldn't find her, didn't bring her back. Uh, but in, the, in this discussion she, with Whipple, she said that she would rather suffer death than return to slavery and be liable to be sold or given to another person. So the whole reason for running away was she wanted complete freedom. And so that, that was really her answer to Washington's question of why did she run away. So now let's head over to Boston and meet Phyllis Wheatley. So we know her today as a very famous poet, but she was born in Africa brought here, uh, purchased by the Wheatleys in uh, 1761. She was about seven or eight years old, spoke no English. Within only about 16 months, she could read, write, and speak English. She was just phenomenal, loved learning things. And the Wheatleys, I guess because this is Boston, they have a little bit of a different attitude towards slavery than, than uh, especially in the Deep South. So they got her an education. She learned Greek, Latin, history, philosophy, literature. Now, in, at, at that time, in the 1700s, that is unheard of for a woman, much less a black woman, much less an enslaved woman. So it's really remarkable, and, and so you've got to give some props to the Wheatleys for having done that. She then, when she was 12 years old, started writing poems and publishing in the, in the local papers. After a while, she had a whole collection of them and wanted to publish them in a book. But in America at the time, even in Boston, as liberal-ish as it was, she couldn't find a publisher because she was black. So the Wheatleys sent her, along with their son, to London to try and find a publisher. The book on the right, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, is the result. That was published in London in 1773. Gave her almost instant international fame. Shortly after she returned to Boston, the Wheatleys freed her. She got married, had probably about three children, it's a little fuzzy on that. And things seem to be going pretty well. Unfortunately, her husband then passed away, so she loses that source of income. And the Wheatleys, who were her primary benefactors, also passed away. Uh, so she died indigent uh, at 31 years of age. 
possibly, I, I don't know, maybe she uh, got sick too and that, that may have hastened it. But, um, so she didn't live very long. But her, her poems are really kind of interesting. And if you look at the image in the top right, or the top left, you see a bunch of names. Uh, the very top one is Thomas Hutchinson, the royal governor in Massachusetts. And the third name from the bottom on the left, John Hancock. So why are those names there? They were, that's a, that's a snip from about two pages later in this book. So what happened was a lot of people were saying, a black woman could not have read, written these poems. They're, they're too good. So all of those people from Boston who were well-respected certified that, yes, we know her, we've examined her, she wrote these poems. So that, that was a major selling point for the publisher or to, to print it and, and, and sell it. So what did she talk about in, in her poems. Um, we'll get, actually, we'll get to that poem later. Um, shortly after Washington became commander-in-chief, she wrote a letter to him, really just a cover letter including a poem that she'd written for him. Most of her poems were to people about things happening in their lives. And so she praised Washington um, and encouraged him to achieve greatness, and she ended her poem with these words. Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side. Thy every action let the goddess guide. A crown, a mansion, and a throne that shine, with gold unfading, Washington be thine. So she was really impressed with Washington. She wanted him to succeed in this fight against Britain, free America from British oppression and tyranny. Absolutely. She's, she's totally patriotic American with that. She wants success. Washington recognized that, and he was pretty impressed. Very happy to have gotten her letter and poem. And about four months later, he was kind of busy as he got up to Boston and putting it under siege. Uh, so he, wrote a, a, he finally wrote back to her and said, thank you, I, I'm, I'm humbled by this. Um, he complimented her on her great poetical talents and genius. And then he invited her to come and see him at his headquarters in Cambridge. There are reports that they actually did meet there. I, I haven't been able to find anything concrete that absolutely says that. Um, so Phyllis had a very keen understanding about freedom. And th this poem here, which was published in 1773, she addressed to Lord Dartmouth, so the He's a Brit. He's basically getting ready to prosecute the war against America. And she wrote to him in this poem, No more America in mournful strain of wrongs and grievance unredressed complain. No longer shall thou dread the iron chain which wanton tyranny with lawless hand had made and with it meant enslaved the land. So she's basically telling a senior British official who's responsible for oppressing Americans, no, you're wrong, stop doing this. That, that's, that's some pretty good pluck for an enslaved woman to write. And it makes you wonder then, well, why does she feel so strongly about freedom? Because she's saying here you know, that, that the, in this poem that Americans deserve to be free. But she wrote, I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's fancied happy seat. And I can but then pray others may never feel tyrannic sway. So she's absolutely a patriot. She understands the cost of freedom and the need for freedom supports American freedom for Britain and doesn't want other people to suffer the lack of freedom that she suffered. So now let's go back up to Portsmouth. Prince Whipple, Mr. Prince Whipple, uh, was also born in Africa uh, and then purchased by William Whipple in Portsmouth. 
Yes, a relative of Joseph Whipple, who we already talked about. Now, Prince fought in the American Revolution with the British or with the uh, New Hampshire militia and potentially crossed the, the Delaware River and, and uh, fought in Trenton. If the, there's a very famous painting about the Washington Crossing, and that does include a black man who many people think is, is Prince Whipple. Um, William Whipple, who was a brigadier general during the war, uh, f formally freed Prince in 1784. But why are we talking about him? Well, he probably wrote, at least hand wrote, because he was literate, in 1779, a petition to the New Hampshire government. 20 black men enslaved in New Hampshire, in Portsmouth, requested emancipation. And in their petition, they used the same kind of political ideas that could be found in the Declaration of Independence. They said that they were forcibly detained in slavery and in said state most humbly showeth that the God of nature, and it's very much an enlightenment idea, gave them life and freedom upon the terms of the most perfect equality with other men. That freedom is an inherent right of the human species not to be surrendered, but by consent for the sake of social life. That private or public tyranny and slavery are alike detestable to minds conscious of the equal dignity of human nature. And what did the New Hampshire government do? Did they free them? No. Instead, they published the petition in the new, there's the petition, published in the newspaper. Now, I think they did that to, you know, bring contempt on these people. It was almost like a joke. They held no hearings. There was no debate on whether they should free these people. However, in 2013, the New Hampshire governor signed a law and it, it said that they were posthumously emancipating 20 African-American New Hampshire slaves. So it took 233 years, but the petition was finally successful. James Fortin lived in Philadelphia. Now, he, he was born free, worked as a sailmaker, kind of taught himself to read and write. He had some basic education in a Negro school run by the Quakers. Um, was after, after, during the war, he was on a privateer, was captured. The captain of the privateer, so he was about 14, 15 years old at that time. The captain of the British ship liked what he saw in, in him and thought he could send him to England and be educated with his own son. James's response was, no, not going to do that. I'm not going to be a traitor to my country. After, the, after he eventually returned from captivity, he bought the sail-making company that he'd been employed in, the, the previous owner retired, turned it into the best sail-making company in all of Philadelphia, and it was a major seaport, became fabulously wealthy, and used that wealth to support abolitionist ideas. So he wrote this essay, Letters from a Man of Color, and, and really, and, talking about liberty and independence, need freedom. So he's absolutely dedicated to helping free other people. And now we're going into Connecticut. The Reverend Lemuel Haynes, also born free, fought in the American Revolution. Actually, after the... Um, he was in the militia, he was a Minuteman, and after the Boston Massacre, he and his unit came down into Massachusetts, stayed there for a while. He ultimately was with Ethan Allen in the attack and capture of Fort Ticonderoga. After that, he returned to Connecticut. He had actually been indentured, so he was, he was, it was kind of like an apprenticeship program to become a farmer. Um, while he was doing that, he also uh, was educated, that was part of the indenture agreement, decided to become a minister, 
actually was the first minister in, in the colonies, black minister, to serve an all-white congregation. So that's pretty interesting. One of his most famous essays, so not just uh, a set of sermons, but, but, more, but broader, uh, is called Liberty Further Extended. And he was talking about how black people have as much right to freedom as, as do white, and that freedom, liberty, is just as precious. So if you're going to be free, we should also be free. And he said, to affirm that an Englishman has a right to his liberty, is a, meaning a white man, is a truth that has been clearly proven. And, we, and has equality as good a right, has a black man, as good a right to equality to his liberty in common with an Englishman. So he was absolutely saying what's good for one is good for the other. Now we're going to come back to Virginia. And we're going to leave our time period a little bit. I've, I've been able to find 82 narratives of formerly enslaved black people in, in Virginia. Now, most of the narratives were from people who were living during the Civil War. So by this time, the idea of these political words has kind of changed. Liberty in, in the founding era really meant you're free to do what you want, but you have a duty to everybody. It's the common good. By the time of the Civil War, it's a lot more like the way we use liberty now. It's pretty much synonymous with freedom. And, and so in these narratives, some of them are autobiographies, some of them are recorded interviews by historians, they, they talk about these same words. Slavery is usually used just matter-of-factly, I was a slave. But sometimes they're not. So a man named Leonard Black said, it's in vain for apologists of slavery to define it by such arguments as this. They will tell you that the slaves of the South are better fed and clothed than the colored people of the North. The fact is not admitted. Prince William County had a man in, in one of these narratives. His name was Austin Stewart. And as he talked about tyranny, he said, whips and chains are everywhere necessary to degrade and brutalize the slave in order to reduce him to that abject and humble state which slavery requires. Freedom was, was very much um, physical freedom. And a man named George Henry said, I caught the sound of freedom and was determined not to be fettered by any man. So people still want these same political ideas, except they're making it, very, it it's very much a person thing rather than a na national political thing. But sometimes there, there was a, a, a linkage with politics. A man named William Grimes had a very powerful statement, I think, on political liberty. He said, if it were not for the stripes on my back, which were made while I was a slave, I would in my will leave my skin a legacy to the government, desiring that it be taken off and made into parchment, and then bind the constitution of glorious, happy, and free America. Let the skin of an American slave bind the charter of American liberty. That is an American patriot. So you may be thinking what I'm, I'm saying here is that white people are all for political freedom and liberty, and the blacks weren't. And that's not quite what I'm saying. Because even famous white people founders realize that there's something going on here that we need to come to grips with. So Patrick Henry wrote, wrote in a letter to Robert Pleasance. Can, can you believe that I own slaves? I, I purchased them. 
it was inconvenient. I, I, I don't know what else to do. And so there is also an, an aspect of this is the time they live in. But he recognized there's a problem here. He doesn't know what to do with it. Isn't sure how he's going to move forward. Thomas Jefferson, you know, he, he's a very clear thinking um, philosopher. <coughs> So slavery is despotism, which we, we fought against Britain for, and it's degrading. How can one half of our citizens trample on the other? So there, there's, there's starting to be a shift that ultimately brings us to today. And so this, this concludes tonight our look back at the different ways America's founders and black Americans looked at freedom's words, the way they looked at liberty and freedom and slavery and tyranny. It's very different perspectives. And I, I think that there's a lesson in this for us. As we try to, and everybody here likes history. That's why you're here. So we try to learn what we can from the past and apply it to our current and future condition. Well, when we do that, I think these words show us that different people, they're, they're coming from different places. They have different life's experiences. And these words, any kind of words and ideas, are gonna mean different things. And so if we think of only our way of what these ideas mean, we're kind of excluding everybody else. So the lesson for us, the challenge for us, I believe, is to try and understand each other. Understand where they're coming from, the other person. We may not agree with them. We can argue, we can debate, but try to understand where they are, and maybe we can have some common ground and collectively move forward for the good of all. So thank you very much. And I am happy to try and answer any questions you may have.